you've heard us talk about there being quite limited changes to access and also relatively limited changes in the immediate term to old framework plans, but you might also have heard quite a bit about the ways in which planning will look different because of this new legislation. And that mostly, most of that discussion about a, a different planning process and structure relates to what are called new framework plans. And as Sheetal said, those are things that we're going to start seeing coming in uh, in about 12 months time or so. This bill requ- establishes a framework that will begin to come into effect in about 12 months or more. Um, and those are called new framework plans. So at that point, people will begin being transitioned onto these new framework plans and new framework plans have a different structure, a different process for how they're made. Um, and the, uh, a variety of different sort of systems and, and, and pieces of law that will relate to them. So for a new framework plan, uh, essentially what will happen is it will no longer be what's called line-by-line line planning, where uh, the NDIA uh, decision-maker needs to decide, do you get this support, do you get this support, do you get this one? Instead, the planning process will revolve around first uh, a needs assessment to determine what is the, the general picture of disability need a person has, and then making that into a single budget um, or a, a budget containing a couple of components that can be used qu- quite flexibly. So I'll take that bit by bit. First, The first thing that will happen if you have a new framework plan is a needs assessment, and a needs assessment will use what's called a needs assessment tool, uh, to determine what is the picture of disability need that the participant has. So we, we've heard quite a bit about needs assessments. Um, I know there's been a lot of concern over exactly what a needs assessment will look like, who will do it, what process they'll follow. Um, this is one of the points in today's webinar where we're going to have to say we don't know the exact answers to any of that just yet. What we know from the law and what we know from what government has said is that There will be a needs assessment. There will be a a, a tool that is used to conduct that assessment. Um, But those things will be uh, to be developed through a co-design process. And so we don't have a lot of detail until that co-design process happens. Um, The government's said, well, look, what they really don't want to do through this process, we've heard repeatedly from a lot of parts of government, they don't want this to turn out like the 2021 independent assessments proposal. And the big point of difference that they have been keen to stress is that they want to highlight this co-design process. Now, I want to be clear, there's, we understand there's not always a guarantee that they're going to get that right. Um, co-design doesn't always, um, you know, the, the disability community has made clear about there have been plenty of occasions where uh, governments have talked the talk but not walked the walk on co-design. But the, 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 the picture that is being painted of this is a process where these needs assessment details are worked out through a co-design process. The little bits of information we do have for how a needs assessment tool will work do sort of suggest that the government's thinking is they'll probably need to come up with multiple different kinds of tools for different experiences of disability where you probably can't use the same needs assessment tool for somebody with, say, a physical disability to somebody with a psychosocial disability or somebody with a sensory disability. There needs to be a a set of nuances to account for the different kinds of disability and disability experiences people might have. Um, Now, the government seems to have have in their minds to be intending that needs assessments will be done by professionals who are either NDIA staff or contracted by the NDIA, So we know they're not thinking of it being a person's own practitioners. Um, With that said, we don't know what skills and qualifications are going to be required for those needs assessors. That is supposed to be something that is, again, subject to co-design, saying, well, when somebody is going to do this needs assessment, what is the minimum level of of experience, of skill, of qualification they need to have to get it right? Um, One thing I do want to speak to in particular um, is that you might have seen some news headlines, et cetera, about people being made to pay for their own needs assessments. Um, Our understanding is that kind of set of concerns largely came out of some pretty specific answers that um, a government minister gave during one round of Senate questioning. But we also understand government has subsequently said that they don't plan to make anyone pay for their own needs assessments. And that was a, a, a sort of a um, uh, an inopportune response that was given by that minister. So we, we don't understand that to be part of the thinking at this point. Um, now, acknowledging that, again, I've, I've given some 
details there, but there's a lot of things that aren't yet clear because of the, the need for those to be designed over the next 12 months. One thing I want to cover off in particular here is this question of um, whole of person, um, the, the way that multiple impairments that a person might have or multiple disabilities a person might have are going to be recognised and engaged with. I know this is something that's of a lot of concern. We saw it in the comments um, from the registrations. Now, the needs assessment is supposed to work at a, a whole of person level rather than just assessing individual disability need and trying to attribute needs to one impairment or another. Um, so it's supposed to take into account a participant's support needs that arise from an impairment that the person met access to the scheme or could have met access to the NDIS for, but also to include where that impairment is impacted by another impairment that might or might not meet the criteria for access, including if the, the second impairment might compound or change or, you know, in other ways alter the need from the, the first impairment. So I, I've, I've given some language from the legislation there, but I'm gonna, I want to really try and unpack this a bit. Um, I know there's been a lot of different understandings of whole of person at different times and by different people um, and a spectrum of definitions that have been used. So at one extreme, one view that's been taken of this, um, and this is the view that the NDIS has sometimes, the NDIA has sometimes taken in the past. They've said, oh, well, only supports that come very directly from impairments that met the NDIS access criteria could be considered and funded. Only supports that come from real, with this really direct link to an impairment that meets the access criteria. Um, that's, that's, I guess, one extreme view. That's a view that I think has been open to a lot of challenge, a lot of debate, um, I think has, has not generally been approved by the AAT in its decisions that have had to consider this. Um, but that is one end of the spectrum of these views. At the other extreme, um, or the other end of that spectrum, has been suggestions that, well, once you're in the NDIS, the NDIS should fund any need a person has from any impairment that you have, regardless of whether that impairment's major or minor, whether it could or couldn't meet the NDIS access criteria. Um, that's and that's sort of the kind of the 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 the, the most uh, open form of whole of person funding. So that is there's kind of a spectrum between those two positions, and we've seen a lot of variations on that being expressed in this discussion. Now, I think it is probably fair to say that what this bill does is take a position that is between those two, um, but perhaps a little bit more towards the more generous, more open end. Um, it is l less restrictive than the approach that the NDIA takes currently to funding um, and probably less restrictive than most of the, uh, the tribunal decisions have been on this too. So... What the, what the bill says is, again, there has to be some kind of link to an impairment that could meet the access criteria. You can't just say, well, it's, a, it's an impairment, it's a disability, I, or there's a disability I have that has a need. That disability wouldn't meet the access criteria, but I should still get funded. That, that's not quite enough. You would need to say some, some disability that meets the access criteria is linked to this support need. But that link, the level of link that needs to exist is arising from. And arising from might seem like, well, maybe how direct does that need to be? Arising from is a very defined and technical legal term. It's used in areas like workers' compensation um, and kinds of negligence law. And Australian law has said that arising from is a very broad term. So um, the link between the access disability and the support need can be quite, quite uh, limited. Um, it doesn't have to be particularly direct. So to give you a couple of examples from cases on this, there was one case where a, uh, a guy who was at, at a work event got drunk at that work event and on his way home he fell out of a window and he hurt himself. The courts decided that in that case his injuries from falling out that window were arising from his work because he'd been at a work event beforehand. There was another case where someone was cooking lunch on their stove during a lunch break and the stove exploded and hurt them. The court also said that is that those injuries were arising from their work. So those are quite broad understandings of the link between the cause and the effect. And so for a, a support need to be arising from a disability that could meet the access criteria can be a relatively broad picture at law of that linkage. I'm aware that's quite 
quite a nuanced set of concepts. Um, so I hope I've done that justice and I'm aware that we may well get some questions about this at the end. Um, but essentially what I want to communicate here is um, this is something where a pretty broad picture of disability is being captured and somebody with multiple disabilities, um, nonetheless, all of the needs that relate in some of that broad picture to the disabilities that meet access should be able to be considered and covered in these new framework plans. Um, I want to note something we've heard suggested is that the needs assessment might note multiple impairments on this arising from basis, but then those impairments might get ignored again when it came to setting a budget later on. We're not sure where that idea has come from. Um, the law as it has passed in this bill says this arising from approach to whole of person should apply to both needs assessments and to budget setting. The NDIS as a whole should be taking this arising from approach to the link between disability and support need. Um, now, um, moving on from the, the whole of person piece there, um, as we've said, for a new framework plan, a person will undergo a needs assessment using a needs assessment tool. At the end of that, a participant will be given a copy of the needs assessment report that is prepared. And that means that you will have a chance to look at that report to give input and feedback before the CEO makes any, before the NDIA makes any planning decisions. And if you see that needs assessment report that's been done and you think it's wrong, um, you think that the needs assessor has made a mistake, they've misunderstood the, th the circumstances, um, we, the, the law provides for uh, a replacement, you to request a replacement assessment. So you wouldn't uh, appeal the needs assessment so much as you would say, I think that's wrong and I'd like a replacement. I'd like another, another needs assessment. Um, basically saying, let's go back and have another go because the first one got it wrong. Now, it's not clear in what circumstances the NDIA will agree to a replacement assessment or not. We expect there will probably be some rules made about when you get a replacement assessment and when you don't. That is something that um, I'll say we think could be improved. Um, we're on the public record in our submissions saying that we thought the bill should have given some more guarantees about when a replacement assessment will be available. Um, instead, what's happened is that will be left up to rules to, do, to give some more definition to. And we haven't seen any plan for what those rules will contain, so we don't know exactly how this will work, but we would expect there to be future conversations over the next 12 months where people can give give input and the sector can engage with government saying here are the times where a replacement assessment is really necessary. I also want to be clear that replacement needs assessments, whether you get a replacement needs assessment or not, is some, will be something that can also be considered through a review. So if you get a new plan and you challenge that plan at internal review or at external review at the AAT, the reviewer, the tribunal member, they will also be able to order a new replacement assessment. So the power to order a replacement assessment is something that will exist all throughout the process of reviewing a plan. Now, I hope I've covered that off relatively clearly. I'm, I'm conscious that there may well be questions at the back end, but I, I think for now it's probably best that we move on to talk about budgets, this other feature of new framework plans. And I'll throw it back to Sheetal because I've talked for long enough. Uh, I'll just uh, reflect um, something in the chat, the thing of appealing your needs assessment, you said that you can maybe ask for a replacement, you're not sure under what conditions or all that, and that she hasn't gone to the AOT and all of that. Yeah, so I know a lot of the discussion has been about can you appeal a, a dodgy needs assessment. Um, I, I think it's worth saying that the appeal looks a little bit different than saying, well, let's have a specific argument about what did the needs assessor do and did they look at this thing and did they look at that thing. Um, instead, what happens is you appeal the plan, and in the course of doing that, um, that appeal can consider, is the needs assessment dodgy and do we need a new one? So I would say there is still a way to, um, to challenge a needs assessment that gets it wrong, um, although I'd like some more definition on that process. There is still a way to challenge it. Um, it just doesn't look like a, a, an argument about the content of the needs assessment so much as whether a new replacement one is needed instead. So in terms of that, you should get another one and it's exactly the same. I would be surprised if it came out exactly the same, I suppose, um, because if the first one, if, it was, if everyone agreed that you needed a replacement one, it would probably be because there was something that ought to be done a little bit differently. 
Um, a bit of rough. I guess we don't know exactly what the tools will look like. I suppose it is possible. It could be worse. And if you got a second one and it was worse, then there'd be perhaps another question of, well, do I need another replacement assessment? I mean, the vibe in the chat room is, if you're not doing live doing those assessments, then who's looking over their shoulder and making sure that they're not, you know, trying to rip people off? I think this is probably a point where it becomes a really, really vital question to consider. What are the qualifications of the needs assessors? Where do they sit in the process? What are the tools they're using? And I acknowledge that's an area where I don't have a lot of detail to give, but that is a question that if that's subject to proper co-design, I would hope that the needs assessors themselves are being given the right skills and qualifications to do the job and the right le- and that might include the right levels of independence as to how they do it and the right levels of accountability. I would expect that those kinds of questions are things that could be fed into a proper co-design process. So I'm not suggesting that there is no reason for the disability community to say, hey, we want some answers to those questions and we want them to get answered appropriately. But I, I, I suppose I would say that a proper co-design process should encompass those things and I think it's worth putting the right kinds of, um, of pressure on, on, on governmental decision makers to consider that kind of feedback. Thank you.